Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'm Dean Christensen, the Digital Marketing Manager at Grid Game Systems. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for this very informative webinar with the catchy title of How to Process 1 Billion Transactions Per Second for Trading Analytics on $25,000 Worth of Hardware. Your presenter today is Nikita Ivanov, the founder of CTO, or the founder and CTO of Grid Game Systems. Nikita has over 20 years of experience in software application development, building high performance computing and middleware at platforms, including, of course, the Grid Gain in memory computing platform. He's a frequent blogger and speaker at industry events and is certainly one of the foremost thought leaders in the space. But before we get into Nikita's presentation, just a few quick administrative points to make. Nikita will be speaking for about 30 minutes today, after which we'll have about uh, 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A. You'll notice that just above the presentation screen is a, a questions button. So click there to ask a question at any point during the presentation, and we'll record those questions. And Nikita will, spot, will respond to your questions during the Q&A segment. We may not have time to get to all of the questions during this event, but we'll definitely answer all of them afterwards. So please take advantage of this opportunity to ask your questions. You can also use these questions to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. You'll notice there's an attachments button in the same area. And there you can get a PDF of today's presentation, uh, also a brief on in-memory computing that we've put together uh, specifically for the financial services companies. Uh, and you'll also be able to find a link to our open source application in case you're ready to give Grid Gain a try. So with that, we're ready to turn the floor over to Nikita Ivanov. Nikita? Yes, Dane, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, at least, and for those from the West Coast. So my name is Nikita Ivanov. I'm a founder and CGO of Grid Gain Systems. What... Um, we will try to cover today. It's a very interesting and very unique use case for uh, for grid gain. And essentially, um, what I try to do is split the presentation, as Dan mentioned, kind of in two parts, and try to keep it kind of um, a more conversational, just to me talking for the next you know for the next hour. So, I will talk for about half an hour, and we'll cover the basics about memory computing, some quick overview of grid gain as well as, you know, we'll dive into the specifics um, of the use case we're trying to discover, uh, trying to cover. But i really like to, to, for you guys to uh, post as many questions because it's really sometimes hard to, to, to gouge the conversation to a specific audience. Somebody, have, you know, some may have a high-level question. Somebody may have a kind of low-level technical questions. I'm happy to answer them all. But for that to happen, let's have a conversation. So... What I'm going to do is we're going to talk about in memory computing in general first, just to set the, just to make sure that everybody on the same page as far as what in memory computing is, what it, what it, can, it can and cannot do, some of the basic reasons why we're talking about in memory computing today so often. Uh, we'll make a quick introduction to the grid gain. Uh, again, it's not a presentation about grid gain, so I'll be very quick. You can find most information on the web. And we'll talk about this very unique, interesting use case where we achieved a billing asset transactions on the financial application on really modest hardware setup. And we're going to have a Q&A, as I mentioned, in the end. So in memory computing, um, it's hard not to hear this term these days. I mean, it's popping up left and right, and you, most of you, even if you're not directly involved with technology, you probably have heard about it in memory computing. We can probably spend the next, next hour uh, talking about what it is and all the different caveats and characteristics of that. But I'll be pretty quick. So first of all, I want to define what is in memory computing from a technical perspective. So in memory computing is really a, a technology that uses high-performance distributed RAM, the memory, to compute and transact on large-scale data sets in real time. Orders of magnitude faster than it's possible with traditional disk or flash technology. Now, every word in this definition is kind of important. First of all, memory computing is all about high performance. 
there's you know no reason to use a memory computing if you don't care about high performance. The good news is almost every application, every business application, every company cares about performance because we have the influx of data coming up in our SLAs and are never going down. They constantly become in real time, in real time, and more real time. So memory computing is obviously about RAM and um, um, Maybe not as obvious, but you know, in memory computing is all about distributed RAM because uh, even today we don't have as we don't have ability to put as much RAM as we need in one computer. So most of the time when we talk about in memory computing, we talk about highly distributed systems. You know, one of the largest installations for Gregian, for example, is over 2,000 nodes in a, in a financial application. Typically, the uh, number of nodes or computers or servers will be a lot less. But it's always a distributed system because we're trying to pull memory from multiple computers into one large pool to use it. We're talking about a computing transaction, large data sets. And in memory computing, it's not only about analytics or not only about operational transactional data. Um, the lion's share of our clients here at Gradient use, use our software and many other software in memory computing to do a variety of different uh, types of payload, processing for, type, for different types of payloads, transactional, non-transactional, analytical, uh, even speeding up Hadoop installations. Can be done with a memory computer. So a memory computer is used for computer transacting on a large data sets in real time. The memory computing is definitely faster than a flash and disk, and probably we'll have the whole slide about it. But um, it's something pretty obvious. But nonetheless, it's important to note that in memory computing is not something that gives you just a marginal improvement, you know, twice, two or three times faster. If you just need it two or three times faster, there's many other ways to do that if you wish so. In memory computing is something that gives you the at least order of magnitude performance increase. And that's where the memory computing as a technology really shines. So as I mentioned, it's basically... The, probably the key point on this slide, a key point takeaway from just understanding what a memory computing is, is probably what I mentioned a second ago, is that it's not about marginal improvements. Uh, in memory computing gives you sometimes a order or two orders of performance improvements for a variety of different applications. And um, that's basically kind of an slice of what we see in just grid gain. It's anywhere from big data applications, processing cloud computing, we have a number of customers in the mobile and mobile gaming and overall multi massively multiplayer gaming industry. It's very interesting use cases as well. Cognitive computing is one of the areas that we start to see popping up more frequently and frequently. Obviously, streaming in the real-time processing, those are very natural for in-memory computing. And uh, those, you know, those applications can get a, a very significant improvement in performance and scalability uh, when they on the line on, on the memory computing. Uh, Gartner actually um, has a very nice way of saying how to basically simply say what is a memory computing. They basically say that the RAM is a new disk and the disk is a new type. And what we see more and more uh, is that the modern data centers, the future data centers, or something actually the future that can be just a year away, will be completely RAM based. And the disks, whether they're flash or, or spinning disk, will be used predominantly as a, as a backup devices. And we've already seen that. We're working with Intel, for example, and we've already seen this reason being implemented as we speak today. Non-volatile RAM coming up a uh, little in that later this year with logic quantities, where you can build systems and even data centers completely in RAM. And the disk really used as a you know, data recovery or data disaster recovery and backup solutions rather than anything else. So that's very interesting. But it's also interesting to understand why we're talking about in memory computing today. You know, we, we've been we've known in memory computing, we've had in memory computing technology for the last, I don't know, 25, 30 years, since actually late 80s almost. There's multiple reasons. Uh, there is a technical reasons for that, but I think the biggest one are the kind of uh, market driving reasons and business reasons. Uh, this is the good diagram here on the slide, and I think it's from IBM slide deck, and it really shows you the the amount of data that we're generating. I don't really 
make any news today by telling it, you know, we have a massive data growth. And with this massive data growth, uh, not only data is growing, but our expectation of processing this data is constantly getting more and more close to real time. 10 or 15 years ago, when I was working in the, you know, grid computing, you know, environment, most of that was in academia, in a, in a particular agencies, you know, in the government. Businesses, commercial organization rarely had any need for a massive performance, except maybe for financial services. Today, obviously financial services, all of them, most of them, in, in real time mode for large analytics, security, fraud protections, but not. But it also spilled over to a lot of different other businesses, anywhere from mobile to social networking to cognitive computing, everything else. So with increase of data, we have also increased in expectation of how fast we can process it. But on the flip side of that, we're talking about the price reduction for RAM. This is a big, uh, this is a bit of a kind of a hairy slide, but what's important to understand here is that the, this are three lines going down on the right corner, right bottom corner. And the first blue line is the price of hard drives, and as you come, spinning hard drives. As you probably know, spinning hard drives are essentially free today. They cost very little, if anything at all. The line in the middle, kind of the yellowish one, is the flash. So flash is more expensive than hard drives. Um, but, you know, in a, in, a, in a relative scheme of things, it's relatively free, inexpensive as well. The upper line, the most expensive in this particular equation, the green line, is the price of RAM. It's still more expensive than the disk. What's important, though, I understand is how much it has come down in, in the years, in the last 15, 20 years. Yes, in the 80s and 90s, RAM was very expensive, and you can only put so much RAM in a single system with, you know, 16 or 32 bits of use. That's why the American computer never took off, you know, away, you know, outside of the confinements of academia and the government and whatnot. But today, you can literally have terabytes of RAM, if not on a single system, but, you know, in a cluster of computers. There's a software like Gradient to pull them together, and the economics are incredibly attractive. And the whole premise of this webinar, if you remember, is that you can really get to a billion transactions per second on literally 10 commodity blades that cost about $25,000 in a hardware cost. So if you think about this economics, that's one of the reasons, if not the primary reasons, why memory computing is so important and so much talked about it and literally so much popular right now because finally the demand for the processing, but economics as well, caught up with each other. And it's not only a um, the land of the large organizations with the larger budgets. You know, um, I can tell you that in Green Gain, uh, we've seen probably half of our customer base and user base comes from a very small technical companies like startups. You know, you can have a five, six people in the company and they already have a memory system with terabytes of RAM. Uh, and that's not an unusual at all. So, and the reason for that, that's availability is, again, it's the economics of that. Uh, economics changed dramatically in the last, uh, I would say, five to ten years. So let's talk about uh, how in-memory works. Um, this is about the only slide I have as far as the technicality on the general in-memory computing. And so um, this is the slide where if you have questions, it would be ideal if you guys, you know, you know put them up so we can – don't spend too much time, but drill down on ideas on the questions that you have. So on the left side, you have a traditional computing. And as you get most of you guys know, in traditional computing, you have your applications on your computers, and you have your data in databases. And typically, databases are installed somewhere else externally. So at least they're up in the same, you know, memory space. So typically, your applications need a piece of data. It issues the request, typically a SQL request, a SQL database, maybe it's a NoSQL database. You issue the request, the request goes to the database, it fetches the data, data travels back to your server, and you do some processing. That's the typical architecture that we have literally for a little bit less than half a century by now. This is anywhere from, you know, client-server architecture, and we have this from, you know, in, literally in J2E and every area of technology in .NET. This is the way the system is built. The applications right there in the memory, then you have a database somewhere in the disk, you issue a request, you get there back. 
in memory computing, if you kind of remove the technicality and details, really what it does, it moves portion of this database into the memory of each computer, and it paralyzes the storage. Again, that's a very important point. Typically, you will, not, you will never have a single computer that will be, you know, big enough, at least for now, to feed all the data from database or as much data as you need, for example, operational data, into the memory of one computer. So typically, we're talking about a small cluster of computers. And what you, the entire data that you have in your database can be partitioned and smartly and intelligently moved into the memory of each computer. And now, basically, when you need to issue the request for a piece of data from the application, you don't have to have a request that goes over the network to some other computer and fetches from there. The data is right there where your application is. It's right there in the same memory space. So instead of basically talking about the seconds, you're talking about the microseconds. The difference between this, I mean, uh, we... It's kind of hard to judge what, what is the second, microsecond, or, you know, millisecond. The difference between this two in the human terms, think about this. If you think about traditional SQL request, if you think about, for example, let's just switch it for a second. If you think about a memory uh, scenario where data resides in the same memory space in the application, uh, accessing this data is like basically a fighter jet flying in a twice the speed of sound. And if you compare this in human terms to a traditional database approach, it's like having a banana slot in your garden. That's the difference in, in between, you know, seconds and microseconds and the milliseconds. The difference is dramatic, and that's the essentially technical core of why you're getting such great performance with the memory computing, because, again, the data is in exactly the same space as the application, the shortest path possible. I, when I present the technical audience, I always keep saying that, essentially, think about the... Um, the chain of calls that needs to happen when you uh, access a piece of data from application through your typical, you know, traditional database. So your application makes a call, and it makes a call to an operating system call, so or basically some kind of library. And then library makes an operating system call. The operating system in the contacts the I/O driver or your I/O subsystem. I/O subsystem then basically contacts the device. The device has a sick time. And I've really seen some most of our devices are block devices. You have to translate this, you know, from the block device to the object format. And then all the way back to your application. It's a very long chain of events that needs to happen when you access any place local database after this network shape if you need to. Now, if you compare that with accessing data with a memory, it's a very stark contrast. Because when you access data in memory, the only thing you need to do is to really have just a point arithmetic. You just need to point to a different segment in your memory and read the data. And most of the time, this data will be in exactly the same format you need it, let's say an object format. And that's the, one of the reasons why in memory computing can be so much faster, because you bypass all of this waste of all this long cold chain and replace it with a very fast point where you can go right there in memory to get any data you need. So... If we move to the next slide. So let's talk about grid gain specifically, just to quickly, just a little bit. So grid gain essentially is a memory computing platform. We also call it a data fabric. Uh, we're open source software. Uh, we have an Apache 2.0 based license for this. We also have a commercial version of it, but our grid gain basically operates. Uh, most information you can find on now the website, so I don't want to bore you with the technical details. But on the left side, you kind of see this, you know, by the high-level diagram where the memory uh, grid gain, I'm sorry, really slides in between your data sources and your applications. And by the way, this is exactly how we use the grid gain in this particular use case we're going to be talking about just a few minutes later. So essentially, the grid gain slides between your data sources in your applications and provide this massive scale and the performance. It essentially tries to decouple your applications from a hardwiring to data sources in the same time providing this all the benefits of the memory computing. What's interesting about Grigian is that it's not it's a not just a particular kind of silent solution. 
you know, if you're in technology, we probably heard about terms like in memory data grid, in memory high performance computing, in memory streaming, all those different types of payloads. And there are individual products or projects for this particular siloed type of payloads. What really makes Gradient stand out is that we provide you the entire platform that supports all these different types of payloads. So if you have today, for example, a need of a transactional behavior, like for example, we had in this use case, you can use Gradient Fabric or platform to do that. If you have more of an analytical type of payload where transactions are not very important, you can do this as well. You can use, for example, SQL with Gradient. If you have a streaming use case, again, you can use Gradient uh, Fabric to do this in-memory streaming processing. Uh, we also support, for example, things like, Hadoop, for example, Hadoop acceleration. So if you have a Hadoop systems installed, you can use our Fabric to really speed up Hadoop installations. So Gradient really uh, is an interesting and unique technology in the sense because it basically gives you this strategic, all-in-compassion view on a memory computing. So instead of basically getting one project and then getting another one for a different use case, spending all this time trying to integrate uh, all those different projects into the kind of working system, uh, most of our clients really pick great gain based on this idea that you don't have to do that. You can take one open source project and really use it for a lot of different types of payloads when it comes to a memory computing. And the commercial version of your game comes with all the right extra features, you know, when it comes to actual mission critical production usage, and you know, anywhere from support notification to the, you know, um, data center application, advanced security, advanced management monitoring, all of these things come with a commercial version of that. Okay, so let's talk about this use case we actually try to highlight as an example of the memory computing. So let me give you a couple of, you know, kind of, you know, historical background on this. So we work with this Bear Bank, which is the one largest, you know, bank in Europe. Actually, it's, I think it's based in, um, in Russia, but it's operates globally. Not really have it much here in the United States, but it's a very large bank in Europe. It's number three, I think, bank in Europe. So they have a very elaborate RFP process where they're trying to build a very new uh, real-time risk assessment system for portfolio, for global trade portfolio trading. Uh, the other RFP, there was a you know, number of vendors. Uh, in the end of it, you know, we beat all of them. Uh, there was a quite interesting vendors from Oracle to Tipco to IBM, where we were able to uh, win this project and win the deal. What's really was shocking to this bear buying and the folks that were doing a lot of the doings there on this is that is the number, a sheer number, sheer performance number we achieved, and. Um, What's interesting about this number is this. We achieved a 1 billion asset transactions per second. I'm talking about real financial transactions. It was not a NoSQL system, but it was a real asset transactions. We also achieved a 1 billion sustained throughput of transactions per second on a 10 commodity Dell blades. There was, a, I think, Dell R610. Those are true commodity blades. The entire cost of this stack, including the, all the blades, all the Necron gear, essentially everything you can do, is about 25K. And we know it precisely because we bought it. It's one of the, one of the test clusters we have in Green Game. So that's what actually very, very interesting. And, you know, we'll, we'll, in the next couple of slides, we'll go down a little bit more details about how it was uh, technically was achieved. But if there's a one slide and the one idea I want you to basically you know, leave you after this webinar is these numbers. This is not a made-up numbers. This is absolutely repeatable scenario. You can get a to a staggering number like a billion transactions per second on a twenty-five thousand worth of hardware today. Even if you remove big data question, just a memory computing is general technology. That's the fundamental revolutionary advantage that we're getting today with the memory computing. This type of performance on these types of economics. So let's talk about details of this um, of this use case. So we need to prove a, uh, kind of prove a concept for them and um, it turned out to be a fairly large project because they wanted to actually test as much as possible. 
But these are some kind of metrics that we had for for the proof of concept for this. So um, essentially what they have, they have they had 20 million entries. Let's assume with those are positions that you have. And uh, each each position or each entry in this particular use case had 10 metrics. So overall, they had about 200 million metrics in the system. So you can think of those metrics as, you know, as the closing price, the open price, you know, any kind of average, just anything you want to happen about in a particular position in portfolio. They wanted to test scenario where the basically events coming in from the market and uh, the the average per, average kind of flow of events, they wanted to do basically half a thousand events per second. So this is basically was the a basic outlay of performance requirements. They had 20 million entries. Each entry had 10 metrics in it. And uh, every second you have a, a 500 events coming into this system. And each event has to recalculate uh, basically one thirtieth of the entire data set. So essentially, you in a, each event uh, recalculates for about six and a half million metrics, and uh, there is a 500 events like this per second. So it's a fairly uh, it's a fairly serious load. And typically, they were basically trying to understand if the market moves in a big way and we have all our portfolios exposed, what it will mean. Can we recalculate as much as we need to? And can we run models? Can we, you know, you guys, if you're in the financial industry, you probably understand all of this. So they needed to know what is the high watermark for the performance throughput for the system. So the deployment topology for this, as I mentioned to you, was final deployment topology was uh, 10 blades, um, 10 Dell R610 blades, Again, it's a very basic, I would say, commodity consumer type blades. Each blade has a 96 gigabyte of RAM, so we had about 10 gigabyte of RAM total in the cluster. And there was a 10 blades, each had 96 gigabytes, so basically it's about a terabyte of RAM we had in the full cluster. What's interesting to know, by the way, as a kind of slight commentary, uh, what we've heard from a lot of analysts and from our own experience is that over like maybe 99% of the old businesses in the world can see the operational data side in just a roughly couple of terabytes of RAM. Yes, your historical data sets can go into the terabytes, and that's where things like Hadoop storage can be invaluable. But when we're talking about operational data stores, something that you actually run the business on, even the bank or as large as this Sberbank, which is essentially the you know, size of a city bank today in the U.S. comparable, can have most of it operational data for a large you know, line of business. Fit literally in a few terabytes. That's very interesting observation as far as you know, the big data and the questions about capacity of the data. So let's come back to the, the DOC. Uh, and what was, on, on this slide, actually, I want to stop for a while because this is basically where we can discuss what was the kind of optimization, what was kind of consideration, and what are, we, what are the features, actually, of grid gain and memory computing we use to get this number. So... We actually, let's start with the access pattern. So uh, they essentially said, look, can you guys build the proof of concept in, with these numbers I just mentioned to you, 20 and 20 million metrics in 500 updates per second. Can you build a system to demonstrate that you can guys do that? So can you recalculate that much, obviously, in a kind of full transactional mode, because this is the financial applications. We need to make sure numbers are correct. And they also basically had an idea that, you know, uh, whatever data you keep in memory has to be accessible. So we have to be able to access it by the key. We have to access based on any field we want to access, and obviously any metric we want to, we want to access as well. So data has to be not only constantly available, naturally it has to be accessible by any means. They also basically wanted uh, to have a fairly redundant system. Uh, yeah, and they ask about the backups, and um, Obviously, Gridgain uh, provides all these capabilities in, as many other in-memory systems. So it's interesting to know that when you talk about in-memory computing systems, uh, first reaction from people who come in the new to the field is like, well, it's in-memory, so it's, it's not reliable because if I pull the plug, it's already gone. And in reality, it's not. Um, any series of memory computing system would have a variety of different strategies how to support uh, persistence. And obviously, we use disk for that. So it's a very interesting. When we talk about in-memory computing, 
it's funny, we always talk about a memory first versus this first. We're not talking about in memory only. Uh, it's, it's a very important distinction. We're talking about in memory first, where memory is used as a primary storage and disk used as a backup device. Versus traditional systems where disks used as a primary storage and memory used as a small caching. Nonetheless, uh, let's talk about some of the interesting optimization that or considerations that we had in this in, in this in particular use case. So data must be loaded in parallel for all nodes, and it's very important because for them it was also important not only how fast fast how fast we can process uh, once data in memory, they wanted to know basically how fast we can load this data in memory because Surprisingly, not maybe not surprisingly, if you have, you know, multiple terabytes of data, it can take a long time to load this data from disk to memory. And in grid game, we have a very special optimization where we load all the nodes in parallel and to know precisely the data set of partition to load to. So you will load very quickly, as essentially as theoretically possible, and it's quick. So naturally, uh, we have a 10 nodes, so we have an equal partitioning of this data, so each node loads and handles one-tenth of, of the overall data side. And this, you know, basic parallelization is very key to uh, to achieving the performance uh, in the memory computer. I mentioned, remember I mentioned to you that in memory computer is not only about putting data in memory. It's also about distribution and parallelization. And that's going to be an obvious manifestation of that. If we have a large data set and we have a 10 nodes in the cluster, we're going to parallelize it by factor of 10. So we also need to iterate over exactly entry, uh, the, the exact entry set. So basically, we have to design a system that basically doesn't do any extra steps. So if we, you know, if we were given an event and we know which entries and which metrics needs to be calculated, we have to be very careful that we only touch those. We cache metrics directly inside of the entries, pretty simple, and we try to batch up as much operation as possible. Again. The batching is is very interesting. You know, I'll talk about it in a second about how we achieve that. But when you have such a massive streaming incoming of events with essentially half, half a thousand events per second, each of them, each of them, we're calculating six and a half million metrics. You really have to find some opportunities to batch up operations, and we did find them. So on this slide, the 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 three points I highlight in the red. Or basically, they, the reason I highlight them because we have a specific feature set in the grid game, which is a very unique feature set that allowed basically to to implement some of these optimization strategies just mentioned to you. Uh, so the first one is a pluggable and user-defined partitioning. Now, sounds very technical, right? What essentially what it does? Remember, just a minute ago I mentioned that we partitioned the data across 10 nodes. And it's very important, right, because we have 10 nodes in the cluster. You know, each computer has only 96 gigabyte of RAM, so we could not hold it roughly about a terabyte of data, which actually, by the way, end up being about a terabyte of data overall in one computer. So we have to somehow partition this data across multiple computers. Now, most of the systems in the market will do it automatically. Obviously, we'll, we do it too. What we do so uniquely in Greg Ian, while well, only you the developer, to have your own partitioning strategy. And this is extremely important because most of the data has a certain locality or affinity built into it. What it means is that certain pieces of data typically being processed together. Like in our example, for example, the entire entry in all of its metrics always processed together. There is no point of keeping entry in one computer in its metrics in another place. Uh, and although this may be a trivial example, this is a very important feature because you as a developer have not only have a full control of how the data is partitioned across multiple servers. So let me explain why it's important. If you don't have a full control and you don't utilize the natural affinity or, or, or locality within your data, you may end up with a certain piece of data that you need for processing in multiple nodes. What it means, you have to go to multiple nodes to process it or fetch data from there, therefore extra noise in network trips. And when you have a, a system like this where you have you know, 500 events coming to each second to, at you, this extra noise 
extra traffic and extra no, uh, network noise will add up dramatically. So have an ability to have a direct and full control about your partitioning strategy down to every bit, every detail of its implementation, algorithmic implementation. It's very important to really gain the performance advantage. Another thing I want to talk about is affinity co-location. It's, kind of, it's kind of related to it, and actually I have a whole slide about it. So um, I'm going to skip it right now because the next slide is actually talks about affinity co-location. It's kind of important to understand why it's, you know, remember, like I mentioned a second ago, that we have a, you know, user-defined partition of the data. Affinity co-location deals with how we actually move computations in the proper order to those places where the data resides. We'll talk about it in a second. The last piece I want to talk about is hot or lot. It's a cryptic name, but essentially what it means, if you know anything about transactionality, uh, transactions are all about acquiring locks. So what is transactions? You basically want to make sure that uh, certain operations, one or two operations, essentially two or more, not one, two more operations done as a single unit, either all of them done or uh, none of them done. And there's some asset properties, I'm going to go into details of this. But typically, the, one of the most costly portion of transaction processing is a lock acquisition. And imagine this. Remember that we have to update six and a half million metrics on each event. If you want to update those metrics in transactional fashion, and you want to do it in kind of an obvious, novice way, well, you have to acquire six and a half million locks, because for each metric, you have to acquire a lock for this metric, so nobody else will update it. Uh, update this metric, and then release the lock so that somebody else can update it. So if you're doing this way, you can forget about billions. You can probably forget about even millions uh, because the lock acquisition is very important and very complex operation, especially in the distributed system. And if you're going to be acquiring 6.5 million locks for each event, uh, the work performance doesn't even come close to this. So we developed a very unique technology in Green Game where we can acquire locks in groups. That's why, in, you know, we kind of internally call it group locking, but, you know, the name of the feature which we have is hyperlock. It sounds kind of obvious, but the implementation of that is very complex because you have to figure out which groups you want to acquire because if you acquire too much and too much or too big of a group of locks, you get in lock contention because somebody else wants to acquire a lock from the same group and they have to wait because you're kind of locked this. So we developed very interesting, very unique technology that, you know, very smartly can acquire a group of locks, which you can define. And again, it's all linked based to the affinity and, and locality, the concepts that's so important to um, distributed processing, distributed memory processing. So with this technology, we were able to really count down dramatically on a number of lock acquisition operations in, our, in this particular use case. And if you ask me, frankly, that probably was the key feature of our product that really pushed us over the barrier of this, you know, very large performance number. Um, because, you know, partitioning and affinity collocation, those are kind of in the high-level concepts, and there are products that actually support them as well. But the hyperlocking is the one feature that allowed it to basically really break out. And in, um, in real-time systems like this, for example, with a large... Uh, type of data payloads. Uh, that is a very, very important feature. So the one, I think the last slide on this particular POC I have is the one that describes, you know, affinity collocation. I really want to stop on this because it's, it's hard to talk about. You have to have some visuals around it. So affinity collocation. Remember I told you that essentially we partition data across multiple nodes. And that's, there's no other way to do this. You have to partition the data. You have to gain this parallelization of processing to really gain some speed. Now, there are multiple ways to do that. And on the left side, and I actually have the terminology to look at data grid and configure it. I'll explain it in a second. On the left side of this picture, you have a, essentially a situation where you just have a partition data without any way to do any kind of you know, parallel computations. Let me explain why this is actually pretty bad. Imagine that, you know, on this, we have three nodes, right? You have one on the left side and two on the right side of this picture. So the request comes to the first node. Essentially, it's kind of, you know, the leftmost node on this picture. And the request needs data from two other nodes. And some kind of processing request. Let's say, imagine you just 
trying to find some kind of averages of something. And uh, the data that you need really exists in two other nodes. So in this traditional use, in this traditional schema, what you end up doing is that you end up actually fetching the data from those two nodes to the node that you were processing, the, on the, on to the node that you will be processing data on. And what's better about it, multiple things better about it, is that first of all, what if you need to fetch a fairly large data set? Your, for, your actual processing node may not have enough capacity to hold this data. But even if you have capacity to hold this data, most likely after you're done processing those pieces of data, you can discard them because you have only limited space in one computer to do anything. So this scenario on the left side of this picture is actually pretty bad. It's a very bad way of using distribution. And typically, you only find it in a very kind of you know, primitive systems. Because again, you constantly fetch in data, you have a massive network traffic, you have a massive serialization and deserialization happening. And most of the time, it's for nothing because you're constantly discarding this data. So what we have at grid gain, and that's a proper way of doing uh, distributed processing, is in the basically the right side of this picture. Here we have the same story as far as a data distribution. So we partition data, and data resides on the different nodes. But that's where what we call affinity collocation, or in another way, we also call it a moving computations to the data. In this, in this scenario, uh, instead of fetching data from remote nodes, we actually paralyze our computations and move computations to the nodes where the data resides that these computations need. It's a very interesting, it's a very unique approach, but it's the right approach to do that. There's a, essentially, we remove all the negative characteristics of a previous picture. First of all, we don't touch the data. Data doesn't move. That's very important because data is typically millions of times bigger than the computations. The computations don't change as frequently. Uh, data can be changing constantly, so you may need to basically, if you need to move, if you need to fetch, you have to constantly fetch the new version of it. If your data doesn't move, it doesn't have to move. It stays there, but computations move, and computations don't change as much. So they can be cached very effectively. In this case, there's no noise traffic because you don't move data anywhere. And again, you don't have to discard the data. And the computations are very small, typically. They're literally, we're talking about bytes and kilobytes at the most. So in this picture, it's a very stark distinction. It's a very important distinction. So in this picture, not only data is partitioned, but computations get partitioned as well. And that's the key behind affinity collocation. And the word affinity here is also very important because we allow you to define what is the affinity between computation and the data it needs. And we're going to collocate both computation and the data in, in one place so that you don't have to do any kind of remote calls, network calls. So all your processing happens locally. And I believe in this particular case, when the computation is done on the remote nodes, they get reduced back to the final result on the, on the, on the, on the processing nodes here as well. So the end result from the end user perspective is the same, left picture or right picture. But the right picture gives you tremendous scalability and tremendous performance increase versus the left picture. And that's the affinity collocation. That's how it's implemented great game. So I think that's my last slide as far as the technical things. And again, um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, it's a pretty deep stuff, and I just glanced over some of the details here. So if you guys um, have questions, this is the right time and right opportunity to ask him. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Nikita. That was fantastic. Um, and for everyone uh, listening, uh, you can see the resources that uh, Nikita has posted there. And also, uh, don't forget that uh, under the attachments button, uh, you can get those other resources that I mentioned at the outset of the webinar here. So uh, we've had a few questions that have come in uh, during uh, Nikita's talk, and um, but feel free to go ahead and ask questions as we go through the Q&A uh, section here. I just wanted to uh, run a couple of the questions uh, by Nikita right now, and and again, we we uh, it doesn't look like we'll be able to get to all of them, but uh, we'll definitely answer any questions that you submit. Uh, we'll we'll get we'll answer them after the after the webinar. So, uh, Nikita, here's a question that came in. 
uh, does in-memory computing only matter to transactions, or is it also for analytics? Well, as I mentioned, no, it, it matters for everything. Um, uh, about 60, you know, I'll, I'll use Virginia as an example, clear. About 60% of our user base probably in analytical world, and about 40%, so it's a little bit too much away from 50-50 in, in production world. What's interesting, you know, uh, that if you ask me like this question, I don't know, let's say 10 years ago, I would say that the distinction between the kind of traditional OLTP and OLAP processing is very clear. You know, if, there, if we have a customer user, it's going to be only OLTP or only OLAP. What we're saying today, and actually rapidly advancing, is the use case where it's in what we call HDAP. It's transactional. I mean, it's a hybrid transactional analytical processing. And not only we've seen this, you know, in uh, kind of the same organization, we're actually seeing the same systems. Because more and more we start talking about what we call operational analytics, right? You know, it's, it's no longer in the, your, your traditional, you know, analytics where, you know, something goes overnight and you have this data warehouses, but things take, they take days and weeks to, to find something. You know, we, we start talking about today operational analytics, something that affects your operational strategy, you know, your financials, you know, affects your trading affects your risk calculations, affects your, you know, back, you know, back tracing, back modeling, you know, all those different things. And so we started to see more and more, and for the last maybe year or two, we started to see more and more of a mixed usage. And uh, I believe it's a pretty much in this trend. You know, it's going to be less and less this clear start transaction only or analytics only systems. Uh, I do believe that in, in the next 10 years, if you, you and I are talking about 10 years from now, we almost will never find a system that is transaction only or analytics only. It's always going to be mixed about. And uh, definitely that's, you know, that's where we're driving the product development in the same, same area as well. Okay. Uh, great. Now here's another question uh, that's come in. Um, I thought the data in memory uh, are lost in the case of a power outage. Is that not so? Technically, you're right. So if you're just taking memory and putting the computer and uh, unplug it, unless you're talking about, you know, if you're talking about volatile memory, which is traditional DDR kind of three or something like this memory, yes, you're right, memory we got. What's, you know, what is probably not true is that it's technically from it's it's correct technically, but in a, in a systems like Gradient, we take a lot of our um, software to actually prevent this. So um, one of the things we do very effectively is that we asynchronously backen up memory to the disk to local disk. So in case that where you want to have certain uh, persistence of your data in memory, we do it automatically for you and literally with no performance hit. Now, if you want to do it, for example, uh, as, if you remember this picture that I have on this, um, of, a, of a grid gain system, okay, grid gain software, uh, you notice that basically it's a kind of sliding in between data sources and applications. So if you have a data source, like, you know, your typical database, for example, and you put grid gain on top of it, we're going to be able to smartly uh, utilize this data source for persistence. So all transactions will go in both places, all updates will go in both places, and we can do read through and write through all these different, you know, um, techniques to really utilize the underlying data store, while in the same time providing you all the benefits of the memory, just kind of the performance. So it, it's a very natural question, by the way. I mean, um, it's a very natural reaction for people coming to the memory company. Believe me, we're here to gain in a constantly filling this question from anybody that memory is volatile, therefore it will be gone. Technically, you're right. In a systems like grid gain, when you utilize the purpose-built systems like grid gain for memory computing, uh, you have a full control of how, how much persistence, uh, how much backup do you want to have. So not only we can persist the data, but we can do a lot of backups as well. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can basically replicate the data across multiple servers in case one server goes down. 
obviously it will be, you know, available anyway because we have a backup. So there's a plenty of strategies how a software like Regin deals with a persistence or just essentially a data safety in terms of crash. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. I'm sure that's, uh, that's an important question for uh, a lot of folks out there, like you mentioned. Um, here's another one. Um, what is a typical implementation time frame for a major financial institution? So maybe you can talk about that, you know, maybe with the Spurbank uh, example, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, generalize that question a little bit. Yeah. Um, we have plenty of, plenty of experience in this area, you know. Probably, I would say, 25 to 30% of our client base is financial services companies. So we, uh, I think, we have a pretty good statistical body to be um, to have a good answer here. The answer is really it varies. Uh, it can be anywhere from a few days in a week to a couple of months. Uh, this bear banker was a brand new application development, so basically, you know, drinking part of it is fairly you know, lim in, in, uh, limited, you know, they have to develop the entire app and Greg in Central, just the middleware that they, they, they end up using to build this application. Uh, if we come into a client that we're working, for example, with, you know, one of the largest Spanish organizations in the world today, they have existing application and, uh, they want to actually speed it up. Uh, we're talking about, you know, literally about a month of development. For them, that's that's another you know kind of data point for you. It's not typical or less or more typical. It's the one data point. It's a fairly large application, and uh, they have to replace data access layer away from SQL to the to the quick game memory fabric. So that will probably take about a month of development effort. So we've had other examples where it literally took several days. Just that. But again, when we're talking about this short period of time. It typically, your applications were built with, you know, this technology in mind, and the transition period was very simple and very short. So, in summary, it really varies, and uh, it goes from days to months. If you just need the ballpark, and I would say probably about a month, it would be typical uh, kind of migration point if you're talking about migrating to the grid game. Uh, if it's a brand new development, it's it's, it's hard to judge. It's typically a small part of the overall development. Okay, super. Okay, here's another one. Um, in the case of Hadoop, does the grid game file system replace HDFS or does it complement it? No, it, well, yes and no, interestingly enough. Uh, we haven't we haven't used the Hadoop accelerator in this particular example with Bearbank, but I can talk about a little bit about Hadoop specifically. So, when it comes to speeding up Hadoop, probably there are two technologies available today. One of the punches Spark, one is Grigi, and both are great projects in my opinion. Um, obviously, I like Grigi too, but Spark is an awesome project as well. We approach the same problem differently. We're both trying to speed up the Hadoop installations. Spark approach, uh, for example, is, you know, they have a new API. So essentially, when you have a you know, Hadoop app, you have to rewrite it to Spark API. And then again, performance. With Great Gain approach, we took a different route. We re-implemented the two core technologies in Hadoop, which is the HDFS file system and the MapReduce implementation. We implemented our own in-memory file system that is fully compatible with HDFS. This was basically where I said yes and no. It can either replace HDFS as a standalone file system, or it can work on top of HDFS, providing in-memory caching. That's why we call it a dual, um, kind of dual-purpose file system, dual-mode file system. And we also implemented a MapReduce implementation based on YARN um, that take, takes advantage of the data stored in memory, takes advantage of the in-memory file system. So back to your question, no, it, it's it's... It's actually yes and no. <laughs> it doesn't have to replace, but it can. It depends on the use case. Uh, I think the biggest uh, takeaway here you, that you guys have to remember is that if you can uh, rewrite your app, then, you know, Spark or Great Game is fair game. You know, you can just basically look at what, what, kind of what provides best features for you. If you cannot touch your application written in Hadoop, 
uh, then grid gain is the only option because we're complete plug and play. You don't have to touch your Hadoop application at all. You download grid gain, 10 minutes later, things are running faster. It's as simple as that. And um, that's, you know, that's kind of advantage of our memory data fabric. But it's, in this particular case, it's complete plug and play. All right, fantastic. And, you know, we're uh, coming up uh, to the end of the um, uh, webinar here, so I think uh, we've got uh, time for just one last question, and this will be an easy one for you, Nikita. Um, question is, is grid gain an open source or a closed source solution? Uh, it's right here on the slide. If you can see it, we are uh, open source. Uh, it's a completely Apache 2 point licensed software. Um, and, uh, you know, look, we, we, we take open source very seriously. It's not a kind of limited software. It's a fully featured software. Uh, if you want to, you can go in production with it. There's absolutely no limitation nor anything held back, anything held back. Uh, what we're doing on the commercial side of things, we have a commercial distribution of the same software that goes through a little bit more hardening and really adds some of the, you know, um, really top-notch features to it. Like when you really go into the mission critical production, settings, uh, we add some features like in advanced security, advanced data center application, you know, uh, rolling updates when you really need to update the software without taking it down, and things like that. Uh, naturally, support, demonification, all the right things. And uh, we see a lot of customers actually, you know, going through the same you know, process where they start with open source, and it's very easy, no strings attached, you can do it on your own pace, you know, there's no pressure. And we've seen quite a few customers actually going into the production, seeing things work, and then contacting us and saying, well, you know, how about this, how about that, when you this particular feature, when you support, and different things. And that's where commercial offering really comes into place. And, you know, we've supported pretty large companies. If you look at our website, we, you know, we've supported commercially anybody from CD to Reuters to Market and plenty of other companies, anywhere from Apple to Sony. So we understand how to support, you know, Serious customers with serious production mission critical applications. Not only not only in terms of support, but in terms of the features and whole commercial offering. So I think it's both of the two worlds. You know, uh, it's the best of two worlds, I would say. You know, you have an open source software that, you know, is zero strings attached. Take it on your own pace as much as you like. You use it, go in production. We absolutely love it. And when you need something extra, we're here for you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, Nikita. That was uh, great. And uh, we want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, we know your time is really valuable, and so we really appreciate your taking the time to attend this webinar. Uh, don't forget that there's those uh, resources that I mentioned under the Attachments tab. And uh, if we didn't get to your questions, we will certainly follow up with you afterwards. And uh, once again, uh, we thank you for attending our webinar, and everybody have a great rest of the day. Thanks a lot, guys.